My name is uh, Wombly Gleshka. Um, my other name is um, Brian Labat. I'm from Shine River, Igaboot, South Dakota. Uh, my land's on La Plante, South Dakota. Um, I have land that's connected to the river, and that's what I'm protecting you know, for, for the people. Protecting for the people, my family, my great great grandchildren, and all everybody. Um, and do you and do you go by Wambly? I go by Brian, but in traditional ways, you know, I go by Wambly Gleshka. Oh, Gleshka. So it's Spotted Eagle. Yep. Yeah. Um, so tell me, what uh, what brought you to? How did you end up at Standing Rock? You gotta talk to my wife on that one, but uh, right. we came by to get my kids enrolled, and my wife wanted to go to Santa Rock, but I wanted to go to um, Wyoming to go to the Devil's Tower because I have a picture of me over there that the first first World Peace Prayer Day, I think that was back in I would say '95 or something or '92, but. Um, so anyway, as we got all the paperwork done for my kids to be enrolled in Shine River, and then we was about ready to head out, and then her phone got this big old me message alert saying that um, 1806 has been closed due to protesting or, or something, you know. Uh, I can't remember what it exactly said. So I looked at it, and then I, I told my wife, I said, you, you really want to go? She goes, yes. I said, all right then. So we went. So we left from here straight, straight up to Standing Rock, and. As soon as I went over that hill, it, it was like a... If you want to know what our past was, that's how we lived in our past. It was very traditional. It was, it was home, you know? It was home to me. And I'm pretty sure it was home to a lot of people. But that, that way of life that we lived in those months, it was our way of traditional life, how we lived. And you know, I just wish we could go back to that, but you know, we can't, you know, but but what I saw there was, you know, besides the drama and stuff like that, I saw people come together as one and protecting and praying and standing in peace. And with all the drama that's going on, I kind of blocked out everything else and I just noticed how people were just taking care of each other, you know working and helping out each other, you know, the way of life and cleaning and cooking and it was just kids were playing and it was just an awesome sight to just to live on our past, you know, it was it was unbelievable. So when I got when we got there, um, we set up camp and, you know, we just Where did you camp? Uh, you know where that sign that had different directions, you know, like LA this way, or whatever this way. I was like four tenths away from there on that tree line behind there. Was that near Cannonball River? Yeah, the Cannonball yeah, River. Right, yeah. Right in that. Okay. Uh, and you camped there the first day and stayed there. Yeah, I, I, that's where I made my um, home. And um, you know, even though um, I came back and forth because I had to take my kids back to school and then my wife. So, and I came, I still came back. Um, that day when we, um, that first day when we got there on, I, I think it's, let's see, what's before October? It was, I think it was October 21st or October 20th when we got there. Um, so we uh, set up camp and then that morning, I don't know what possessed me to do it, but I told my wife I'd be back. I was going to check on the front lines, and, and as soon as I went up there, um, there was action going. You know, there was um, the people were getting prayer to go across the fence to go stop the bulldozers and everything that's desecrating our our land and, and our graveyards and our grave sites. So a lot of um, people were going across. And a lot of people were saying, no, don't go across because we've got to bless the um, land first before we go across. So I don't go across the fence. Everybody else did, and the whole group of people went across, and a lot of us stayed back. And as soon as, um, as, soon as they did the prayers and stuff like that, they told us to go get them and bring them back. And so I went over there, you know, 
a group of people went over there with cameras and stuff and and as I got to that site to where the helicopters were flying around and and then that's the first time I ever saw that LRAD and that black car and and then uh, it, it was just strange you know how cops and helicopters and whatever was going over there protecting big oil not protecting the people because they're they're on their cars and badges and everything it says to serve the um the people to protect and serve you know and they weren't doing it they were protecting big oil so as i was watching and taking pictures of everything um, documenting um, I noticed um, people were getting arrested, and when they were getting arrested, you know, they were chasing everybody back to the other side of the creek, and I just kept on staying there and trying to get as much um, film as possible or pictures, and then as soon as uh, they started coming towards us, um, I just started telling everybody, let's get out of here. So. A bunch of people, I think 75 people or 74 people got arrested that day. So a lot of us kind of like spread apart and I was telling people to spread apart because they're in groups. So that's why it would be hard for us to track. And um, so they were, you know, following us back to, back to the road. And I just kept on zigzagging because um, there was hills and stuff and obstacles in the way for them, you know, because they had vehicles and I was on my, <laughs> I was running. But, uh, you know, we had um, people coming in with vehicles, picking up people left and right, and I told, told them to get the elders, injured, kids out first, you know. You know, don't worry about me, you know, just keep on picking up everybody. And then as I kept on getting close, you know, get closer to the road, they were getting right behind me. <laughs> and so I just kept on zigzagging. I, you know, I didn't want to get arrested that day. And, you know, I was, you know, I didn't want to go to jail, you know. I don't. I'm not scared of going to jail, but I just don't want to go to jail that day because I promised my wife not to go to jail. <laughs> so. Very good reason. Yeah. So. And so after that, um, after after we brought everybody back and and then um, you know we, I went back to camp and you know told my wife sorry that it took so long to come back, but it was a major action that you know that. I didn't know about it. I would just happen to be there. So, and as the days went on, um, North Camp was being developed. You know, you know, everybody decided, let's go put a camp up north. So, me and the wife and kids went up there and, you know, did our prayers and ceremonies. And then after that, we cut through the fence and, and just hop, started building our teepees and sweat lodges and everything and set up camp. And for some odd reason, I had a bad feeling, so I took my family back home, and I came back because I knew there was something bad going to happen. And when I came back, you know, everybody was being antsy and stuff that they're coming in, they're coming in, and you know, they're going to raid us. So I didn't know what was really going to happen. So I just, you know, did my prayers, got prepped up and everything and and as soon as as soon as that day October 27th came and that was uh, the longest day I've ever experienced with law enforcement <laughs> so so I went up there um, was watching observing and how they were all surrounding us but they were on top of the hills and stuff surrounding us and I just started just walking towards the, the no surrender camp after I passed the north camp. And then that's when they started, you know, that's when the, the first line, I guess, got overthrown. That's when uh, Red Fawn was probably arrested. And then uh, another group of people um, that came in and, you know, they were doing their actions and, and they were all going in I don't know if they were being tough or, or cursing at the cops, but cops are are, are trained to deal with uh, violence and stuff like that. So either the third line or second line, I don't know which one it was because there were so many lines that day I was involved in. And when um, 
And when these group of people, they were saying, we're black snake killers, we're gonna go and stop these guys and, and do this, I said, and they come join us. Like, uh, yeah, well, I see this line right here, I'm gonna wait right here, and when you guys come towards me, then I'll join you guys. But I'm staying my grounds right here, and all of a sudden, they all started going and hop, hipping the raid, and like, we got this, or whatever, and all of a sudden, they just got swallowed up. I mean, it was, black snake yeah, the black snake colors, they were saying, black snake colors, and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> and they all got swallowed up. By so the, by, the by the cops, by all, by Morton County and everybody, this uh, this swallowed up just like a it was just like a wave, Poof. they were gone just like that, you know. And then I was I was thinking, man, I gotta come up with a different tactics because I know they're they're uh, trained for violence. So as they were getting closer to me, I saw one of the sniper guys uh, on top of that gun or on top of that truck, and he was pointing his gun at me. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> hey, I'm unarmed. But, you know, they just kept on coming. And, and when that sniper got close to me and I had pictures of him taking, you know, pointing that, that rifle at me. And I said, I looked at him and I said, I said, you know, I said, if you shoot that gun at me, you know, everything that you work for is going to be washed away. And all you officers that are um, protecting big oil, you guys are on the wrong side of the law because you guys are supposed to be serving and protect. That's your oath. But, you know, a lot of them looked down and they were, you know, I saw some of them started crying, you know, and a lot of them were like, you know, like just wanted to break away and I was praying for them to come on our side. But this big old guy, you know, he was all masked up, big old macho guy, and he says, step up! And all of a sudden everybody was like, you know, jumped up and it started coming towards towards me. So I just put my hands up and just started walking back and it says, you know, I'm just going to protect my people here. I'm doing your job, you know. So as I, as I don't know how many times I got sound blasted, probably about six, eight times or if not even more, you know. Can you describe what is, what's that? The sound blasting was... It was a pretty painful to the ears, but I'm a carpenter, so I'm used to loud music or loud machinery. But um, for some odd reason, it didn't affect me that day. Um, I could feel my insides moving around as the blasts were coming towards me. But when I opened up my mouth like that, kind of like, pop, you know how you pop your eardrums? Then the sound went away. Uh, even though they were the, even though they were still sound blasting me, so it didn't, I said, huh. So I just kept my mouth open, and uh, the waves or anything didn't um, affect me anymore. So I just stood my ground and you know, just stood in front of the line until I got pushed all the way back towards uh, North Camp. So did that come off the the, the L rads? The yep, it came off the L rads. The yep, the, yeah, that big old mach whatever that big sound old thing. Super yeah, yeah. Right there. <laughs> So that day, I thought I was gonna be deaf, <laughs> and um, so I was. You know, it was a lot of stuff I cannot say because it's you know. Uh, it's, what tore me up was it wasn't the cops, it wasn't the guns that was pointing at me. It was the people that were screaming and crying for help and saying, "Why are you doing this to us?" And it still burnt in my head. And. Every Thursday, I, for the longest time, I could not sleep, and I popped my knee that day. Um, I don't know what else happened, but I, I believe I got shot in the back, too, because that night I couldn't sleep on my side. <laughs> and with my leg hurting, too, you know, I, I had a rough night sleeping. So, but... When everybody asked me why am I here, I told them, I said I have land in La Plante and my land is connected to the river and that's what I'm protecting. I'm protecting for, for the people, for my grandchildren, my unborn great-great-grandchildren and for all, you know, everybody that's below this pipeline. So, and with that, with all the actions that went on that day, you know, I was involved with, uh, I, was, I didn't disarm Kyle Thompson, but you know, I was there 
Were you? Yeah. Can... But I didn't, you know, I was going around behind him. You know, I was going to go flank him. But when I saw the BIA and tribal cops coming over, you know, real fast, I'm like, oh, good, you know. So I didn't want to get shot, so I came back, you know. And then, yeah, yeah, they had live ammo. So, you know, we was all waving up our hands, and here he is over here. And, and then they pulled in and, you know, helped the cops, the BIAs, to get the fence cut and push it down and got him through there. And then they disarmed him and stuff. So, you know, you saw the video. <laughs> Thompson, and yeah. some people who followed, but what, what happened that day, or at least from what you saw, um, or what you know about it? When I was um, bringing people back in my truck, because a lot of people were screaming, crying, saying that they could not handle this no more. You know, how come the cops are doing this to us? So I said, well, my truck's just right here. So I yelled out, said, if anybody needs to ride back to the main cap, hop in. I don't know how many times I went back and forth, but one time, when I, the last time I did, that's when I noticed, you know, the, the truck and people were gathering up and stuff. And I parked my truck on the other side of the bridge, and I just started because the cops were in. The, and um, you know, after that situation was resolved, you know, I didn't really tell anybody that, you know, because when I got to camp, I didn't I didn't register or anything like that. I just went in as an independent. Um, soldier or independent um, Akichita. So I didn't join any forces. I just became independent. So when the front lines were involved, I just hopped in. You know, you know, even though people already knew who I was because they knew that I was there, standing in front of those all those cops while they were pushing us back. But was there anything? You know, you find yourself in a situation like this, which. It's really hard to describe to people, you know, you, what it's like to stand in that space where you're, you already mentioned, like, you know, you're looking at their badges that like, say to mm. protect the people. And, yeah. You know, it just, it's a, such an intense feeling. Um, yeah. Did you find anything else about yourself that sort of surprised you in your response? I've been in the longest walk back in 78, I think, or 76, and I've been in actions ever since I was a kid, and with my uh, history of with the law all the time, you know, just brawn fighting, um, I knew how to, how, how, I knew all their tactics and stuff like that, and how, how they react to violence. So that's why I stood, stayed peaceful, and that's why I didn't curse at them. I did not throw anything at them. You know, I just kept my hands up, back, and protecting the people that was behind me. I I just mentioned it because I found I always had an image of myself, for example, that I would I'd be this fighter mm -hmm. because I was always like that in other spaces. But I found that peacekeeper, yeah. protector. Yeah. And you realize like that's the yeah. I mean I don't want to say that's the real courage, but like it takes yeah. a lot to stand there. Yeah. Um I had at one point I wanted to just jump in there, get just jump in the middle. Um, she hopped on the longest walk. For some odd reason she wanted to be on that. <laughs> What's your mom's name? Uh Yvette Marie Labat. She's from Shine River. Yeah, those things. I just bought some of those today. <laughs> they're, yeah, they're hard to get out. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> just recording me going. Just, yeah. Da, 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 da. <laughs> um, so, um, geez, you were there. I want to ask you some other questions about camp life and sort of how things are now. But before mm -hmm. we go there, um, what do you think people need to know, or how are you how are you processing this experience? I mean, you mentioned you couldn't you couldn't sleep, you know, at certain times. Um, it's been tough for a lot of people. Yeah. No. Like to have experienced it and 
really want it back. Yeah. Um, if there's anything you're doing or anything you want to share with people, especially other folks who are struggling. Um, but it's also one of those things that we spend a lot of time like, yeah. men don't do that, you know, no. but they need to because yeah. you all took in, yeah. all took in a lot of pain there. Well, for me, it's staying busy and my kids is what's keeping me going. Every day I think about it, you know, my daughter, Zikata, you probably met her, but she was three years old at the time and, well, not at that time, but she went through a heart surgery, open heart surgery at three years old. Her heart was bigger than her fist three times. But with all that stuff going on and sometimes I could see stuff in the future, I mean, I'm... If I know something bad is going to happen, then I usually just stay away from it and walk away. Or if I just, just deal with, you know, just stay there and just deal with it, you know. Because life is always a challenge. <laughs> but, but with that experience and stuff, I don't know. Because I'm pretty open mind, um, flexible. You know, for the longest time, I didn't believe I had that, was it PTSD? But, you know, every time Thursdays would come around, I couldn't go to sleep. And I remember that Thursday, that Thursday night, you know, after, we, after they pushed us all the way to the bridge, um, yeah, it was, it was just, I guess traumatizing, I guess. But I, I, I'm just so, I don't know. To tell you the truth, I didn't really have a, um, a mom and dad to grow up with, you know, like everybody else, you know. I never met my dad. My mom, we always traveled around a lot, but I've always stood with, stayed with strangers. So, um, there's a lot of stuff that I've been through as a child that I don't want my kids to go through. Um, especially with, um, you know, with our movement and stuff going on, you know, back with the longest walk and, and every, every stuff that's going on around here in the past 20, 30 years, you know, um, and I'm just hoping that people will wake up and realize that, you know, fossil fuel is not the way, you know, something else has got to be the way, you know, we, we have to make the change, not the corporation or whatever, we have to make the change to to make it happen. And I'm just a, a dad just protecting his grandkids. You know? That's all I am. And um, I mean, it's very hard for me because I don't, you know, I'm, I always protected people, but I'd never really thought about, about myself, you know, even though I get injured or whatever. But now that I have kids and, and it's totally different, you know. I've sobered up, you know, I quit everything. The only time I smoke cigarettes is when I'm around here. <laughs> yeah, it brings out all the good habits. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, yeah. Um, Tell me a little more about um, just camp life for you. So you're sort of a, a road camper. You didn't necessarily, as you said, you didn't necessarily get into you know, one of the main, you know, no, I've been independent. Camps. Yeah, I've just been independent. I, I stayed at that camp because it was, you know, it was just home for me there. It was home for us. Um, Tell me about, like, what what was it? I mean, when you first, almost I could see through your eyes, like, coming up over the hill when you first saw the camp, mm -hmm. um, what you were feeling then, and then when you got there, what makes it different? Why was it? The teepees. Why was it special? The teepees. The teepees that when I got there, it was like seeing a movie. It was just inspiring, you know. It was like, whoa, you know. You know and, then, and then the singings, you know, like going on right here. Every night, the singing, uh, waking up to the guy saying, um, you know, shine your crosses, you know, and, and um, break out your pipes and, you know, all the old uh, tea capo. Yeah, yeah. So I loved it when he kept on saying that, and, and I loved it when everybody woke up 
before dawn and you know before the sun came up you know people were getting ready and you know getting prepped up for the day you know it wasn't just getting ready for action it was, it was preparing for for gathering the wood for for cooking for heat um, my tour was to um, you know since I had a truck you know I just went and got water for anybody that needed water you know for cooking cleaning now uh, one owner's kitchen was my my main is that your kitchen? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I helped him out a lot because my grandpa, um, Joel Lafferty, was there. So oh, Joel Lafferty's your grandpa. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. His, uh, uh, I don't know how many, my grandma's Florence Lafferty, and I don't know how many brothers and sisters she has. And I'm not quite sure about my family history, but I know I come from a big line of big family that we're just all spread apart from California to here to Mississippi to, I don't know if there is anybody in um, New York, but, you know, it's just, uh, camp was, was home. And that's the only thing I can explain to it. I mean, it wasn't the actions, it wasn't the drama, it was just, just being there with, um, strangers but it felt like family you know everybody helping out together it felt like a big old family that's what camp was and and protecting each other and uh the man the most amazing thing was those schools where the kids were there you know learning and and just you know you know making a bag out of a toy you know you know, just creating something just to, to play and get their minds off of stuff, you know. And, you know, as for me, I just, just kept on staying busy, you know, gathering wood, you know, water, and, and just getting everything prepped up and did, did all my pitchings, you know. So that's what I loved about it. It's, uh, I mean, it's not out completely, but to take money, mm -hmm. the greed out yeah. of the picture, yeah. even for that just amount Yeah. Time, yeah. It's just your human value is like what, what you did yeah. for somebody. Yeah. Maybe, you know. And I did this out of the kindness of my heart. You know, I didn't ask for no go go fund me, no whatever it is. I've just like everybody else, I went broke. <laughs> I had money set aside to build a house over in Laplante, and that's all gone. You know, I'm two months behind on everything, <laughs> just like everybody else. But. I've been independent, you know, I've been a carpenter for 28 years and I just know I've been working since I was 13. So I know how to make money and, and cash is gold. <laughs> <laughs> well, just let's uh, do this um, maybe right now. Sounds like you have a you also you feel like a lot you got a lot of responsibility because you do have land mm. on the water. Yeah. Um, it sounds like it gives you some strength. It's just you got to do it. Yeah. Yeah. You got to fight. You can't. Yeah. Not. And it's more than even just your family yep. that you're talking about. Caring yeah. About. Is there anything? You know, the hard part is we can't go back. No. Right? Yeah. But, um, yeah, move forward. You know, in moving forward, are there things that you want people to know or things that they, you think they should be, that we can be doing? Should we try to do it again? Should we do, you know, like what, what are the, what, what's the, what is the spirit of Standing Rock? The spirit of Standing Rock. That's a, kind of a tough question. But, I guess the spirit of Standing Rock is just we were there to protect Mother Earth. You know, that's that was a my that was my spirit. You know, I'm not really a, a spiritual guy. I'm not really a praying guy. I'm not really a, a atheist or anything. When I see something that's right or wrong, it's it's not right. Then I need to address it. You know, regardless, you know, whatever, you know. And with this going on in Standing Rock and, and the cops doing what they're doing and DAPL and everything, that was totally wrong, you know. 
sometimes I wish I was a lawyer to to file whatever I don't know what they call it but <laughs> yeah like follow the Constitution yes you know? <laughs> yes all these things where it's part of it's part of like the you know native experience which yeah is, you know that some of the world got to see a little bit yeah of like how folks are treated when they're still yeah, peace Occupy and prayer. Land that the yeah. Wants. Yeah. You know? And I, I don't know why the land was the way it was. I mean, that's treaty land, but I guess the reason why I don't know why people didn't do anything there before, before even the pipeline. Oh, that was um, private game. That was for hunting. That's what that was for. That's what I was told. It was for hunting and providing for the for the family. You know, just like every other reservations where you know there's certain parts where it's for gaming you know is there um gee there's a lot we could talk about but um i don't want to keep you here all night is there is there anything you'd like to add or say that you feel you don't talk about well on facebook i've been telling everybody we must set aside our differences and work and stand together as one you know divest and fossil fuel and go green and protect Mother Earth and you know this is for our great great grandchildren 